class is now in session. Welcome back. As always, this is Miskatonic University's English 210 Graphical Literature and Society and History, better known as the Comics Course. I am your Professor Hamby, here with your TA, Rowan. Say hello, Rowan. Hello. Now, I would expect a little more excitement from you today, Rowan, because... You requested this lecture topic. Can I did. You, you did. Can you explain to the class what the topic is? Captain Marvel or Shazam and the history of him. Now, I'm not saying it is incorrect to call him Shazam. It is no longer technically true. However, you are a syphilitic donkey lover if you do. <laughs> Just saying. So, the history is closely tied into the history of Fawcett comics and Fawcett mm -hmm. publications, which you said you were as interested in as Captain Marvel. Yeah. I always like when we go over the history of the companies. Well, I think this is a part of history that too many people ignore, because in many ways, the history of the 20th century, and now 21st century, is closely tied to the history of media. Mm -hmm. You know, before... The great age of media, history was defined by wars and economic trade. But with the advent of cheap paper publishing and then radio and television and now various internet means of distribution, history is partially defined by this mass media that so many people have access to, which really started in the late 19th, early 20th century. And I also find it kind of interesting because it also kind of tells a story on how we got our four, our only really four important published companies, Marvel, DC, Image, and Dark Horse. Right. And there's some interesting history as we go through here. So we're, we're going to turn the clock back a little bit in time to 1919, 104 years ago. Damn. With a guy named Wilford Hamilton Fawcett. Ooh. Now, apparently, his short nickname was Billy. And while he was in the army, he, he kind of has a superhero story in his own right in a way. Oh, wow. Um, he ran away from home at age 16 to join the army to fight in World War I and ended up, uh, I believe, in the Pacific Theater. Mm -hmm. And he earned his captain stripes. And so, between being a captain and Billy, when he came back to civilian life, his sort of casual nickname ended up being Captain Billy. People called him Captain Billy. And when he came back, he became a police reporter. Oh, that's great. I mean, that does, is almost like the setup for a superhero, right? That In its really own way. is. And note, Billy became the name of Captain Marvel, Billy Batson. <gasps> You're right. Probably not a coincidence. Definitely. Probably an homage. And we'll talk more about why it might be an homage in a little bit. So, he began news, began his career as a newspaper reporter, his civilian career, but then he quickly decided to go into publishing. And he created a magazine called Captain Billy's Biz... Bleh, bleh. Captain Billy's Whiz Bang. Mm -hmm. Now, a whiz bang is a term for a sort of armament they used. Uh, I think it was an anti-aircraft uh round of some kind, but I'm not sure about that. Anyway, it was a pretty bawdy magazine mm -hmm. that included a lot of crude humor. Um, it was not an intellectual's magazine, but definitely appealed to a large, lower class, but for the first time in history, literate population. In fact, it, it was so well known that it was immortalized in a musical called The Music Man. Have you ever heard of The Music Man? Yeah. It has had multiple runs on Broadway. Yeah. It's had runs off Broadway. It's it's played in American high schools as productions and local community productions year after year. It is one of the best known musicals in American history. It is a classic, and it will stay a classic, at least be a force through schools. Right. At least. And there's a line where a character is being made fun of, and it goes, Is there a nicotine stain? I can't talk today. Is there a nicotine stain on his index finger? A dime novel hidden in the corn crib? 
Is he starting to memorize jokes from Captain Billy's whiz bang? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's how well known it was. It's, it's, we still have people across the country singing it, uh, as a lyric who probably have never heard of the publication. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was successful. I mean, there's a reason the author of uh, The Music Man was familiar with it. By 1923, it, had, it was circulating over 400,000 copies a month. Mm -hmm. That is not insubstantial. And on top of that, Captain Billy decided to create Fawcett Publications to publish a range of magazines. Because why should he be limited to one success, right? Mm -hmm. And he ran the company with his four sons. He also had a daughter. Oh. But she's not mentioned much, so she may not have been involved in the publishing business. But this... Um, 425,000 units a month was a foundation on top of which he was able to build a lot of other magazines, by the way, one of which is still being published to this day. Oh, really? Yes. Woman's Day. You can still find it in the checkout lanes of grocery stores today. Oh, wow. Now, it's being published now by Hearst Publications, and there are more magazines of his that have changed name and are still being published today. One very famous one, however, only ended a couple of years ago in 2019, Family Circle. Mm -hmm. But yes, he published some of the most popular magazines of the day. Now, eventually those were sold out and sold again. Now the remaining titles are published by Hearst Magazines. Uh, but one of the most successful, a mechanics magazine, is still published under a new title today. Mm. So that's kind of how big it was. And then he decided to create his own distributor. Now, to distribute, he had to agree to terms with some other publishers to make them feel they weren't going to get squeezed out of the market by him being a distributor and a publisher. So he had to agree to terms that he would not reprint books himself. So the idea was in those days, you published a hardback, and then later a cheaper paperback was made. We still do that to this day. But he thought, there's a loophole here. What if instead of just reprinting, I publish original paperbacks? Mm. Now, I don't believe he was the first one to do this, but it wasn't a super common practice either. And it was very successful. In fact, uh, I believe that Kurt Vonnegut's first published work was for him in one of these paperbacks. Mm. And there were a number of notable writers who published under pseudonyms in these original paperbacks which were seen as lower class than first publishing in hardback. Mm -hmm. A perception that, again, still persists to this day. Mm -hmm. Although unfairly, I think. Having something be more accessible doesn't make it lower class. Yeah, agreed. But it's not in a more expensive hardback. You pay less money that's seen as lower class, which is a form of elitism I despise. Agreed. And classism as well. Yeah. Anyway, by the time you hit the 1930s, the book publishing business is doing well. And in the periodicals business, they're selling over 10 million a month. That is not small numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Not small potatoes. All right. Hello, hound. We have a hound in the office again. She's one of the older hounds and is generally quiet, but has a few issues. We usually have to trick freshmen into getting near her for her to get a meal. Fortunately, freshmen aren't very bright. And she's cute enough they try to pet her. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, they learn to not do that pretty quickly. Right. If they live. So, by the late 30s, by 1938, we see Superman being published. And now, comics have suddenly gone from being reprints of magazine strips and jokes and puzzles to superheroes. And money. Cash on the table money. Now, Captain Billy was not the kind of guy to go, that looks like free money being printed. I'll ignore it. No, no, no. You don't become a captain that way. No. <laughs> so Fawcett Publications suddenly had a new spinoff entity or a new child entity, Fawcett Comics. Mm -hmm. And they aimed their first title for February... 1940, just two years after the debut of Superman. 
really just barely a year and a half after the premiere of Superman. I should say the cover date was February 1940. Uh, it actually was published in December of 1939, which had a cover date of February 1940. That's a thing in comics, which maybe we'll do an episode on why that all happened later. But it, again, still persists to this day. And Wiz Comics had, I'm trying to think how to say this. One of the first things you have to do in the comic industry is secure your trademarks, mm -hmm. right? Right. And your copyrights. And you need to copyright characters. Now, the laws are a little different now than back then. Back then, they were running off the copyright law of 1909, which required that you actually publish something with a copyright symbol on it to protect it. The law is actually more permissive to self-publishing now and doesn't require the same sort of uh, signatory symbols in the United States. So they decided that they were going to publish Flash Comics number one. That was going to be their first comic. Flash Comics. But they needed to go ahead and grab the copyrights. Mm -hmm. But they were concerned that... Flash might already be taken. So they also were going to publish uh, Thrill Comics, number one. Mm -hmm. And these were both to be dated in January of 1940. Mm -hmm. Now, note, they're being published before that. But cover dated 19, January 1940. Now, do you know what an Ashcan is? An Ashcan comic? No. I don't know where the term comes from. This will be worth checking at some point. But it's basically a very cheaply made, very small print run that will secure your copyright. So imagine you publish, um, I don't know, My Awesome Comic, number one. But you're like, I don't want to get sued if somebody else has already published My Awesome Comic as a title. And so, but I want to secure it as fast as possible, so I'm going to publish an ash can. And they generally would be about this size. Imagine something like a little bigger than a paperback book, or a bit larger than a large phone in this day and age, in black and white, on the cheapest paper possible, and they might only print like 40 or 50 of them. But that's still enough to secure your copyright. And... These two comics, Flash Comics and Thrill Comics, were nearly identical and featured the first story of Captain Thunder. <coughs> Was that a commentary on the name Captain Thunder? No, I don't, not on purpose at least. Okay. And as you can see here, here are pages from Flash Comics, mm -hmm. number one. And we see Captain Thunder. Does he look familiar? Yes. He looks like the name we do not speak of. Right. He looks like Captain Marvel. Well, they did these ash cans, and then it turned out they had reason to believe that they wouldn't be able to successfully defend a copyright on Thrill Comics, Flash Comics, or Captain Thunder. In fact, Captain Thunder had just like the month previously been published as a character in Jungle Comics. Uh, with a totally different concept, of course. So, they punted, and they made it Wiz Comics instead of Flash or Thrill Comics. And here's where it gets a little weird. Their first issue, they were thinking, you know, these ash cans were number one, so they started Wiz Comics as number two. So there is no actual Wiz Comics number one, which... It, it continued to get weird, and you could tell their lack of experience in publishing this kind of thing because, you know, magazines aren't numbered like that. Mm -hmm. It's the January issue, the June issue, but they don't worry about numbers. So they were doing something new, and they obviously weren't very good at it because they published two number threes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so no number one, a number two that's really a number one, a number three, that's really a number two. A number three, that's the real number three. And then they got, and then with number four onward, the numbering is actually correct. Oh. 
Oh, no. <laughs> Now, this was actually published December of 1939, cover date February 1940. And by the time we actually get to February, a tragic event happened. Mm. Captain Billy passed away. Oh no, not the captain. Captain Billy passed away, presumably natural causes. He's a captain, you would never be sure. Yeah. He actually was a very wealthy man by this point. He rubbed elbows with the rich and famous like Clark Gable. He ran an estate that rich and powerful people visited a lot. He was famous for taking this country road and paving it at his personal expense rather than waiting for the state to do it because his guests couldn't be expected to be driven on a dirt road. Kind of snobby. Right. But... It gives you an idea of the kind of figure he was. He was not a little uh, figure. And this is going to become important as we approach the lawsuit, because I find historically a lot of people have put Fawcett Comics in this underdog position. That's not true. People are like, oh, well, DC Comics was just beating up on Fawcett. Fawcett was a big dog that could protect itself. And we'll get more into that, certainly. So these two existed. Now, we will talk about this later when we talk about the discovery of them, but this Thrill Comics and Flash Comics number one became objects of mythology. People, hardcore comic scholars, thought they did not actually exist. Damn. Because they just disappeared into history. And we'll talk about that later. Ooh. Yeah, it's kind of, there's some interesting stories there. So, we'll talk about that as we hit the 1980s. Mm. But now let's talk about Billy Batson himself. And for that, I'm going to leave off the ash cans, and we're going to go to Wiz Comics number two. Now, you will see in here many pages that are taken directly from those ash cans. Okay. And you will also see that this was not a solo title. Much like Action Comics number one, even though it features Captain Marvel on the title, it had a ver variety of other characters inside it. And we'll talk briefly on some of those. Also note, the cover image has Captain Marvel throwing a car against a wall, which might have been intended to invoke Action Comics number one Superman uh, holding the car up and lifting it. Maybe like the moment that happens next afterwards? Yeah. And those similarities between Captain Marvel and Superman, Superman being the highest selling character at the time when this came out, we'll talk more about. Now, let's look at the origin and appearance. So we have Billy Batson, who's in what colors? Red and blue. blue. What are Superman's main colors? Red and Red and blue. But he does have yellow. Right. Now, interesting, when he becomes Captain Marvel, the blue disappears. And his outfit's a little more different. Mm -hmm. Now, a mysterious figure takes him down into this trippy, cryptic place. This art, by the way, is by an artist named C.C. Beck. He became absolutely iconically connected with Captain Marvel, which will become important later when we hit the 1970s. Uh, but also... Over time, you can see his art evolve amazingly. And he became a very skilled artist. Not that he was bad now. I mean, even this stuff, as crude as it is, is better than I could draw. Hey, on the cover, he had five fingers. Yeah, that's better than AI could do. Mm -hmm. uh, but look at the wizard Shazam there. He looks oh. great. Yeah. And that, that, that train. I mean, I, I have to believe that... Uh, there were artists that looked at that train and went, oh, yeah. I mean, that's just trippy. I mean, he got into, he was doing 60s psychedelia art without the drugs. We don't know Presumably. That. Well, he's an artist. He couldn't afford it. Well, and it was wartime America. Everything was bent towards the war effort. I like the look of the cave. Well, it was 40, so we weren't technically in the war yet. Anyway, you were saying about the cave? 
Yeah, I was saying I like all the fun pastel colors in the cave. Yeah. And then they go past these seven deadly sins, and we enter this just trippy scene with this ancient wizard sitting on a throne with a giant book as big as he is sitting next to his throne and a giant stone over him held by a tiny thread. Remember, kids, stranger danger. Indeed. So, basically, we get a recount of Billy's origin story. He was poor and penniless because his parents died and his uncle stole all of his money. Take a note of the art of the uncle Mm -hmm. with that receding hairline and shifty look. And kind of, I mean, they really made him look was, like the miser. And giving him pedo vibes. I wasn't getting pedo vibes, but okay. I think you just look at anybody who's creepy and attach pedo vibes to them. It's a common look. I worry about you <laughs> in so many ways. So, he tells Billy, you speak my name and you'll turn into Captain Marvel. Mm-hmm. And when you become Captain Marvel... You will have the wisdom of Solomon, the strength of Hercules, the stamina of Atlas, the power of Zeus, the courage of Achilles, except without the Achilles heel. Mm. Uh, and, and, well, I'll say, and the speed of Mercury. Now, these powers got interpreted in a more expansive way over time. Mm. In the early stories, these are actually fairly literal. Although, when they say courage of Achilles... They do actually mean his invulnerability also, Mm. without the Achilles heel. But over time, they interpret things like, well, speed of Mercury includes flight. And the wisdom of Solomon includes telepathy. And stuff like this. What does Solomon have to do with telepathy? They interpreted wisdom as super intellectual mental powers. Mm. Over time. Actually, pretty quickly. So, the story goes on, he foils a crime, his first big bad is Dr. Savannah. Which, if you look at him, he has some similar vibes there to the uncle, doesn't he? Oh, he does. Same artist, though. Yeah, so it makes sense. But he's completely bald, he's even more, like, rat-looking. Yeah, it looks shifty. Now, note, after he turns into Captain Marvel... Billy can't fly between the buildings. He goes to the top of a building so he can jump from one to the next. Wait, th- that's what Superman had to do. He didn't have flight at first. Exactly! So just as Superman began as a Superman, mm-hmm. Captain Marvel had the name the world's mightiest mortal. That's interesting. I, I originally assumed... Both of them could originally fly in both in both their first issues, and both of them actually were more like superhuman levels of very human attributes that got expanded on over time. Kind of reminds me of Captain America in a lot of ways. Well, Captain America became more and more, but Marvel always made an effort to keep Captain Mar Ca- uh, Captain America from being out of control, powerful. Well, that's what I mean. I mean, their starting points remind me of what they did with him, with just making him a human at peak. Yeah. Which, actually, they contend is still true to this day. Um, The official Marvel definition for Captain America's strength is peak Olympian. As well as his speed and everything else. So, in theory, Captain America uh, is simply the best a human can possibly be. We had cups of noodles before we started, folks, and one of them just went off the edge. Oh, well. So, both of them had its powers over time. However, whereas by the late Golden and certainly into Silver Age, Superman started developing X-ray vision and heat vision and could crush coal into diamonds, which actually Captain Marvel probably could too. But, I mean, Superman would, like, spin a planet backwards through time and stuff like that. Mary Sue behavior. Right. Captain Marvel became a Mary Sue. Don't get me wrong. Captain Marvel is a Mary Sue from the very beginning, just as Superman was. But his powers never got quite as outrageous. Whereas Superman, by the 60s, could just one episode, one issue, suddenly display some new power that was completely unrelated to anything else. 
Captain Marvel generally had to use his existing powers in increasingly ridiculous ways, but was still limited to those existing powers. Mostly. Notice I say mostly because that still includes things like when the Wisdom of Solomon suddenly gave him, say, telepathy. Right? Mm -hmm. So, by this time, Superman was also well known for fighting, you know, mad scientists. And in some ways, Captain Marvel was even more of a Mary Sue than Superman. And I say a Mary Sue in the sense of a idealized self-insert. Mm -hmm. Superman, in some ways, reflected this idea of being parentless. Because he's an orphan from another world. And people forget this, but the Kents were not in Action Comics number one. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Kents were not added for years to come. Yeah. And so he's an orphan. Mm -hmm. Well, so is Captain Marvel. Mm -hmm. Except... Superman, we don't meet till he's an adult. For all the young kids reading, Captain Marvel is still a kid who becomes an adult temporarily. Mm -hmm. He's even a better Mary Sue for the readers. Mm -hmm. So, which was kind of brilliant on their part. Mm -hmm. And there was a difference in behavior. The Superman, honestly, could be kind of a jerk, especially in the early issues. Whereas Captain Marvel always does things... Not only the right thing, but in a relatively nice way. Mm -hmm. And so it led to different tones in the comics. Now, by the end, what happens to Billy Batson? Well, instead of a newspaper reporter, he becomes a radio reporter. How different. How different. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the other stuff here in Wiz Comics number two. And then we're going to jump into talking about how... DC Comics responded to all this. Okay? Oh. So, this was an anthology. Also introduced in Action Comics number one was Superman, was Zatara, the magician, who was the father of the more popular figure now, Zatanna. Mm. Well, here we had Ibis, the Invincible, an ancient Egyptian mummy who comes back to life with his magic wand. And he can just do anything, automatically. He just, you know, shields whole cities from bombardments, creates new buildings, summons money. Everything's trivial for him. Until somebody steals his wand. And I always felt like he was a bit of a Zatara ripoff. Mm. The Golden Arrow. Dun, dun, dun. Which basically has this young kid who grows up on the frontier, blonde-haired kid, who goes great with nature, and then becomes a better frontier, Bozeman, Indian type than any Indian could ever be. Uh... The only thing they didn't do to make him a complete white savior trope is that he didn't grow up in an Indian tribe. They were able to hold themselves back from that? Yeah, they held themselves back a little bit. Damn. So... Now, then we had Spy Smasher. He became another iconic character of wartime comic books. Now, uh, I don't even know what I was going to say there. He became an iconic character. Along with figures like um, the Bullet-Headed Man and Bullet Girl. And a variety of others. And then, a, and then other characters here like Lance O'Cassie, which continued this sort of adventure pulp tradition that led straight into comics of, you know, tough guy characters, whether they're boxers or athletes or whatever. Which I feel like was really popular during wartime and during the Cold War. Oh, absolutely. Especially wartime. Yeah. So, it was successful. I mean, Captain Marvel was an instant success. As his family expanded... And, and I say family because we're in Superman, not long after the debut of him in Action Comics number one, within a few years, they started wanting more. So they created Superboy. So instead of him having a sidekick, they now put him as a child in Kansas, in Smallville, Kansas. They didn't go that direction with Captain Marvel. 
Instead, he found a way to share his powers with other actual family members. So you now had Captain Marvel Jr. You had Mary Marvel. Uh, you even had some joke characters come along like Thunder, the Marvel Bunny. Um, you had a talking tiger that originally was someone's imaginary friend and became real. You had the fat uncle who wanted to pretend he had Marvel powers and would try to quick change into an outfit and make excuses for why he couldn't fly and stuff. Oh, damn. But where in a DC Comics, they would rewind Superman to a childhood or they would take Bruce Wayne, Batman, and have him adopt an orphan as Robin, mm -hmm. Captain Marvel felt a little more wholesome in having this family vibe which had to be attractive, especially in an age where families were starting to move apart and families were losing people to the military efforts, even if their family had what... Because 1940... By the time we're heading into 41, we're heading into us actually entering the war. And even before the U.S. actually entered the war, between Britain and everyone else in the European conflict... Many people, and remember this was still very much an immigrant country at the time, many people had already lost family members to the war mm -hmm. in Europe. And the found family trope has always been very popular. Right, although in this case they were literal family. Mm -hmm. They were actually like blood cousins and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, DC was watching this, and what DC really watched closely was the sales numbers. Because that's what matters. Because Captain Marvel didn't just do well. Captain Marvel sold better than Superman. <coughs> Damn. Say that again. Damn. Damn. So, Wiz Comics number two came out December 1939. <coughs> cover date, February 1940. And by September 1941, a lawsuit was filed by Detective Comics and Superman Comics, mm. which were both owned by the same parties, but legally separate. Okay. Now, over time, they would merge to become National Comics. Which became DC, DC Comics. In fact, they merged to become National Comics during the lawsuit. So let's go back to that myth I mentioned earlier about how Fawcett was the scrappy underdog here. Mm -hmm. Fawcett was outselling Superman. Not the underdog at all. Now, the co-defendant named in this was Republic Pictures. Why? Because there was Captain Marvel movie serials happening that were crazy popular. And they weren't alone. Fawcett Comics had been very smart about marketing their stuff for media. Other characters like Captain Midnight were already on TV mm -hmm. and in radio, and they were doing the same with other properties. They were basically in the early stages of building for radio and TV something like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, except they never made an effort to combine them. Mm. But they were the early leaders in this. So, the first arguments happened in May 1951. The case wasn't decided for until August of 1951. Now, notice 1941 to 1951. This case had been ongoing for 10 years before they got to fully argue it. They dragged them along. Well, and the war probably didn't help. Oh, so, the ruling of that case was that Captain Marvel infringed on Superman. Too similar. Costume too similar, powers too similar, everything too similar. But, it was decided in Fawcett's favor because critical comic strips used to establish DC's case didn't have that copyright symbol printed on it. By McClure Syndicate, McC the 
McClure uh, newspaper syndicate screwed up. Now remember, they're still operating off the 1909 copyright law at this point. It hasn't been overhauled for how we know it now. Well, National Comics appealed. And it went up to a guy named Judge Learned Hand. Now, I love this name. I love fun names. Same. And this is up there with Thelonious Sphere Monk, the jazz musician. Learned Hand. I don't know if this was a more common name in the day, but if I met a guy named Learned Hand, I would bet he was either a guitar virtuoso, a pull shark, or a kung fu master. (laughs) <laughs> no, he was a judge. He was a Harvard-educated judge. And if you go to check his Wikipedia article, you will find it is long. Very long. He has been called the most important American jurist not to sit on the Supreme Court. Fascinating fellow. And indeed, I, I ended up getting sucked into reading about him. And I want to go back and read more. He just seems like an absolutely fascinating part of American history that most people don't know. Mm -hmm. Which I love. Always love that. So, this ended up on his appeal docket. And he overturned it. He said that he overturned part of it. Mm -hmm. He said that Captain Marvel was not a copy of Superman. Mm -hmm. Not because they weren't very similar, but because they both drew so heavily from cultural antecedents. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this is where the writer of Captain Marvel, uh, I think his name was Parker, came in and talked about, well, when we laid out things like, you know, the wisdom of Solomon, the strength of Hercules, we wanted to draw on classical motifs. Mm -hmm. And then they proceeded to argue that Superman did too. And that they were both basically copying an amalgamation of Greek and Roman heroes and mythical figures. And that National Comics argument that they were both in skin-tight red outfits with capes and both reporters wasn't enough. And argued that them both being reporters was simply that they both represented a fundamental American ideal of seeking truth and justice Mm -hmm. that couldn't be copyrighted. Because it's so generic. And Judge Hand agreed. However, he did say that individual stories might have violated the copyright, Mm -hmm. where individual Captain Marvel stories duplicated either plots or elements so closely that they might constitute a copyright infringement. But the character itself didn't. Right. Now, this is where it gets a little complicated because you will go out there and read all kinds of stuff that gives different interpretations of this to the point where many people have gotten it wrong. He didn't rule for Fawcett or DC exactly. He actually was sending it back to the lower courts. Mm. And National Comics... At this point, now we're now hitting the 1950s. Mm. Now, what happened in the 1950s? Do tell. The comic industry tanked. Right? (laughs) Right. This is the age of McCarthyism. When they were having the Senate hearings, or the House hearings, on, you know, the danger of comic books, and Seduction of the Innocent was published. The Comics Code. And the great... Comic scare happened, right? Mm -hmm. But sales were already tanking. People were losing interest cyclically in superheroes. Well, it didn't help that a lot of their reader base had grown up. Right. Well, and there is a cyclic phenomena that happens in comics that we've seen where, you know, it goes up and down. Where basically you continue writing the same stuff, same stuff, same stuff. People grow up, aren't interested in it. People grow up, take over comic writing, write fresh, new, interesting stuff gets new readers, and the cycle resets. Yeah. Well, with sales already tanking heavily, Mm -hmm. National Comics decided it wasn't worth it. They've already paid over 10 years of legal fees. 
This was going to stretch on how much longer for who knows how little they might recoup from lawsuits over individual stories. And then they'd have to fight over how much they'd get from them. It's so forever. And, you know, frankly, Fawcett didn't really want to pursue it either. Because their sales were going down like everyone else's. Did they settle out of court? So they settled, yeah. And at the time, one of the interesting things was happening was that although through the 1940s, Captain Marvel had very much outsold Superman, Superman was one of those characters that is proven immune to the cyclic effect. His sales may go down a bit, but his sales are still strong, like, say, Batman's. Captain Marvel's were not. His cells were tanking along with everyone else. So it just wasn't worth it to anybody. And, by the way, I want to mention Judge Hand. He actually, the very next year in 1952, was part of another National Comics lawsuit where they sued Fox Comics for Wonder Man infringing on Superman. Damn. <laughs> And he actually provided a legal definition for the copyrightableness of a superhero based on his identity, his powers, and his goals. Which I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. And given how respected he is and how cited he is, that is easily usable in a legal argument to this day. So by 1953, just two years later... Fawcett just decided to stop publishing comics. They just got out of the business. And what they had, they sold off to other entities, largely Charlton Comics. Mm -hmm. Now, Charlton Comics had become a home for a number of people over the years. Mm -hmm. In fact, it became one of the few places that would still publish Steve Ditko after his huge meltdown uh, at Marvel Comics uh, with Stan Lee. And it was kind of a big, you know, before the days of Dark Horse and Image, Charlton was kind of the bit, one of the big alternatives to DC and Marvel in the U.S. market. And superhero market in general, because superhero comics are distributed all over the world. Now let's fast forward to 1967. Do you know what happened in 1967 with the character named Captain Marvel? They hadn't been published in basically 15 years. No comics with Captain Marvel have been published. And this guy at Marvel Comics, who I just mentioned, Stan Lee, Stan Lee Leibowitz, said, we're now Marvel Comics, and nobody's published Captain Marvel for ages. We need to grab this trademark. So how do you get a trademark? You use it. You say it's associated with you. So he created Captain Marvel, the Kree warrior who betrays the Kree Empire to become a hero of Earth and help protect it. Mm. Until he died of cancer in the 1980s. Oh. It was actually a pretty seminal moment in comics, but we're not telling that story right now. Now, of course, Captain Marvel is more associated with the Carol Danvers character. Although she wasn't the first female Captain Marvel. There was Captain Marvel, who was Marvel, then a female Captain Marvel, then Carol Danvers Captain Marvel, which is the one we largely know now, and the movie was based around. Hmm. I was wondering if there was any relation between the two characters. N nothing other than a trademarkable status. Hmm. And they were concerned, they being Marvel Comics, that DC might jump on it. Hmm. So they wanted to make sure they got there first. Now... Fast forward five more years, 1972, DC licensed, I think from Charlton, I think Charlton owned the rights at this point, but I have to check, uh, licensed Captain Marvel and the related characters. Now, because Marvel Comics was publishing stuff titled Captain Marvel, DC was afraid they would get a trademark lawsuit if they called their comics Captain Marvel. So they started calling their, they kept the character named Captain Marvel, but started naming the comics Shazam mm -hmm. to avoid trademark confusion. This started 
one of my pet peeves in comicdom uh-huh. of people thinking the character's name is Shazam. Mm-hmm. Clearly showing that they are missing important chromosomal bits from their DNA. <laughs> right? This will forever be the funniest thing that pisses you off to me. Bless your heart. And I mean that. It's just it's such a minor thing to get mad about. Everybody has those weird <laughs> things that piss them off that make no sense. And this is what I'm on. I know. And you know me. I don't generally get nerd rage about nerd stuff. Well, that's I what... find people who get nerd rage funny. And yet, this one thing. Well, this is, this is why it's so funny to me. Because you don't get like this. So when you get like this, this is what makes it funny. And I can see that. I can see that. <laughs> now, I have to say, I adore the character of Captain Marvel. And part of what I love about Captain Marvel is that he's a character out of time. Superman, they always updated to be whatever the time was. Captain Marvel was that character from 1939. Mm -hmm. And he represented purity and innocence. And the ability, despite being innocent, of facing evil and defeating it. Mm -hmm. Goodness. I like the idea of there being symbols of goodness in the world. You know? Yeah. So... By 19, sorry, 1972, DC licensed, they called it Shazam, and they continued to market and promote the character that way. And that same year, they published, started publishing Shazam Comics, where they explained that the character had been disappeared for 20 years because Dr. Savannah and his family... Because they had expanded to a whole family of evildoers to counter the good Mar- Marvel family. Had created a trap of suspended animation for the Marvel family, trapped them in it, and then screwed up and trapped themselves in it as well. Mm-hmm. So they don't get freed until 20 years later, all of them together. Okay. And so the world has moved on into the 1970s, but they haven't had to age or change any. And within a year, they had established, because they had, since the Flash of Two Worlds storyline, established the idea of DC as a multiverse, with, say, World War II-era Justice Society on Earth-2, and then Superman and all the contemporaries on Earth-1, they put the Captain Marvel family, or as they were now calling them, Shazam family, on Earth-S. Right. For something. <clears throat> and, and I want to note that when they started republishing Captain Marvel comics under the name Shazam, I'm going to show you something here. Now, Denny O'Neill was the writer. Uh, I probably should do an episode just talking about Denny O'Neill someday. His influence on the comics industry is incredibly vast. Mm-hmm. Uh, and certainly a well-known name to anybody who reads about the history of comics. And the same for the editor, Julius Schwartz. I want you to see on the credits page who was the artist of the first DC Comics Captain Marvel comic. It's C.C. Beck, who drew Captain Marvel in the 1940s. They brought him out of retirement to draw the first issue. (laughs) Sorry, that took me aback. I was not expecting them to bring him out of retirement. Yep. And he did a great job. The art was brilliant. And this, in fact, let me bring that up so you can see it, because I'd like to talk about the art a little bit. Now, the volume I'm bringing up, for folks who don't know it, is DC Shazam number one, February 1972, so exactly 30 years after the first one. Uh Uh-huh. February 19... Well... More than 30. So that was February 1940, so 32 years after the first one. February 1972. Mm -hmm. And look at the art. It's so much more crisp. Yeah, it's very clean. Well, I mean, obviously their publishing technology is better. But he redrew Mm -hmm. the same scenes he drew back then. 
Look uh -huh. at the different angles. These aren't copies and pastes at all. Uh -huh. Look at the movement of the beard as he moves. Uh -huh. Very different. And then the art here. And he kept the same style, just improved. Right. I mean, he can he improved continuously throughout his career. But it has that sense of humor to it mm -hmm. that a lot of comics don't. So, that was 1972. Now, there's a myth, actually, a weird myth, that the first DC publication of Captain Marvel was actually a whole different story that was actually a year later. In Superman number 276, uh, which back then was 20 cents. Yeah, you can't buy a comic for 20 cents anymore, folks. Can't buy anything for 20 cents. Right. We have Make Way for Captain Thunder. And it's art by Kurt Swan, written by somebody named Elliot Magan. I'm not familiar with him. And a lot of people believe that this multiverse crossover was the first appearance of Captain Marvel, albeit as Captain Thunder, in DC Comics. But it's not. This was actually published a year after the licensing agreement in the beginning of them publishing Shazam. And this story is a little funky because it features this young, not Billy Batson, but Billy Fawcett, Fawcett. transported to Earth. And the bad guys have made it so when he turns into Captain Thunder by rubbing his magic belt with a lightning belt on it, lightning bolt on it, that he turns into Captain Thunder. And when he does, Captain Thunder is evil. And he gains his powers from an ancient shaman who gives him the powers from Native American spirits. Because it's always an ancient shaman. Right. So, I only point this out because there is this myth that some people believe that this was the reintroduction uh, to DC Comics. But it was actually published as a weird sort of multiversal homage story, but after... Uh, Billy Batson had been reintroduced. Now, I don't know if they had explicitly added him to the multiverse yet. I don't believe at this point that Superman had actually met Captain Marvel yet. So this might be the first case of Superman meeting a Captain Marvel variant. So that part may be true. Now, at this point, we're going to go back to Fawcett Publications a little. We've already mentioned that Fawcett Comics has been gone for decades. Fawcett Publications at this point was winding down. Uh, I believe that basically at the point that Captain Billy's parent kids were retiring and hitting age of retirement, mm -hmm. that they just weren't continuing the company. They were okay selling it off. Mm. And so in 1977... The assets of Fawcett Publications were bought by CBS Publications, which is a huge media conglomerate, of course, who bought it for $50 million. And most of what was Fawcett Books was acquired five years later from CBS uh, by Random House for their Ballantine Books, which in my youth, Ballantine Books, and Ballantine Books was only dissolved as an imprint a few years ago, but they were the publisher of cheap sci-fi and fantasy novels. Well, maybe not the pu One of the publishers in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And you knew that when you saw Ballantine on a cover that it was going to at least be decent. Mm -hmm. So this takes us up through the early 1980s, which is when interesting things began to happen. So that was 1982, mm -hmm. 1982 when Ballantine Books acquired Fawcett Books in those paperbacks we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Now, keep in mind, during all this time, those ash cans we talked about, Thrill Comics and Flash Comics, had hit the point where even though old Fawcett people had sworn that, that Flash Comics existed, mm -hmm. that it had become a considered mythology at this point. Mm -hmm. It's like, it would have shown up. Mm -hmm. 
Now, by the 1970s, we had something special happening. Mm. Comic conventions, comic newspapers, comic magazines started being published mm -hmm. about the industry itself and history. And a somebody for, I think it was the Comics Reporter? My memory is a little vague here. Anyway, uh, discovered an old Fawcett employee who had an actual ash can of Flash Comics number one and was able to share it with them and let them copy it. Let's go. This was a huge revelation for people. Mm -hmm. But people were still like, okay, so we now know that Flash Comics actually existed and that's what became Wiz Comics. But this whole thing people have mentioned about Thrill Comics, this still has... this. People must be confused about the titles and stuff, mm -hmm. right? Well, in 1985, a guy from Metropolis Comics in New York got wind of stuff being disposed of from the CBS Media Group. Remember, CBS bought Fawcett Publications. Mm -hmm. And under the watchful eye of what he described as a bunch of little old ladies... He went down to a warehouse at the Transit Authority and was allowed to root around in boxes. Mm. Especially this set of boxes that they could not determine who legally owned them. Ooh. So they were going to be incinerated. Oh, oh. And he could not remove stuff from these boxes. But it included a gold mine of material. Including old uh, Fawcett Comics fan club stuff. Stuff that had been given away in the 40s to kids and no existing versions. And in the far back of a filing cabinet, he found... The original? He found the Thrill Comics ash can. Woo! And they wouldn't let him have it. They said it had to be incinerated and destroyed. No. So he began putting stuff in boxes that they said he could take and things he couldn't. And then began a game of what he described as three-card Monty. Su carefully moving stuff from box to box to box until they lost track of it. And he could slide the ash can into a box that he could keep. <laughs> you know so he basically stole it. But I'm sure that's the most fun those little old ladies had in a long time. And that is how we ended up with actually today knowing that those existed in the real history. Amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, 1985. What had happened just in 1984 in DC Comics? Crisis on Infinite Earths. For the five billionth time. And, well, no, that was the first time. Oh, okay. Oh, trust me. The The history of, boot, of reboots to follow will come relevant in just a minute. So, post that, it was not clear if Captain Marvel still existed in the DC Universe in any way. Mm. Certainly nobody had seen him. So, in 1987, a miniseries was published called A New Beginning. Shazam! The New Beginning. Um, I remember reading it when it first came out, and it was really good. Mm. And it very closely tied the origin of Billy Batson to Dr. Savannah. Dr. Savannah was now made one of Billy's uncles. Who, now Dr. Savannah was, remember I said that creepy uncle looked a lot like Savannah, but they clearly made him different? Well, now they're made into the same person. And Dr. Savannah is the one who actually kills Billy's parents by... Uh, sabotaging their car, so the brakes failed. Oh, no. So we now have the tie-in of this. And we have this other interesting thing. We have Butia, who I did not talk about. She is from Wiz Comics number three mm -hmm. and was an evil ally of Dr. Savannah and is now his daughter. Oh. There's, there's some weird stuff that happened there. I'm not going to get into the whole Dr. Savannah leching on what later became his daughter. It's a little weird, but technically different characters now. Oh. I know. And this reintroduced him to DC Continuity. Mm -hmm. And it was really good. I really liked it. 
then, in 1994, something very important happened. They were no longer licensing the rights. They were able to buy them outright from whoever had them. Probably Charlton Comics or somebody that Charlton sold them to. But So from 1994 onward, DC just outright owns all the Captain Marvel-related properties. And then... In that very same year, Jerry Ordway published a hardback book called The Power of Shazam, where he very closely tied the reemergence of Captain Marvel and Shazam from history, well, Shazam needing a new champion, to the existence of Black Adam. Now, Black Adam had existed before, but he had simply been one of a large rogues gallery for Captain Marvel. That included everything from an evil worm named Mr. Mind to a Neolithic caveman with super strength to all kinds of other figures. But now, Black Adam is the nemesis of Captain Marvel. His next major appearance was just a few years later, 1997. And it, it, it has to be talked about, but... Uh, 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 Kingdom Come by Alex Ross. Mm -hmm. If you've never seen Kingdom Come, I will get you a copy. He painted the whole thing. Oh, wow. Now, keep in mind, there's Alex Ross doesn't do comics a lot. And do you know why? Why? Because comics can't pay him as much as his other clients. <laughs> he, is, he is an absolutely stunning artist. Well, isn't that the same problem Neil Gaiman has? Oh. And this is a low-res image, and that is painted. Not digital painted. But, like, actual painting? Right. Damn. And yes, that is a problem Neil Gaiman has, too. Comics just can't pay him what other markets do. And Shazam was Captain Marvel put forward in here as a counter to an older Superman. Mm. If there's anyone that can counter the Man of Steel, it is the world's mightiest mortal. And he is used as a symbol of innocence lost. Mm. And done very powerfully so, actually. Mm. And thus it was until the 2010s when... It's okay, you can say it. I don't want to say it. You, you gotta do it for the podcast. <sighs> he became... Shazam. His actual name became Shazam. They gave him a cowl for some reason. Apparently, being a superhero flying super fast, not being able to see around you is cool. They wanted um, to make his outfit more distinct from Superman. They gave him lightning powers, which I'm mostly okay with. They made it so he no longer had to say Shazam. He only had to think it. And they took Billy Batson, the symbol of innocence and purity, and made him into a shithead little brat. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to take you to a scene here. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, he makes fun of people. He says nasty things to people. There's some actually decent world building in this. But... At the point where Billy Batson actually confronts the wizard, and the wizard is transforming him, basically, well, first of all, let's look at the wizard for a second. Mm -hmm. well, he looks decrepit. And he's also black. Yeah. Now, the wizard has always basically been represented from being North African or Middle Eastern. So finally, somebody understands what that looks like. What that looks like. At last. So, I'm, I mean, I'm totally cool with this. Yeah. I'm not against change, because I don't like change. Mm -hmm. ah. You just want it done right. Right. So, they're arguing, and Billy is being an asshole. And basically, the wizard says, Well, I need somebody who's pure and innocent, but I guess I'll have to settle for you. What kind of superhero origin is, I'll settle for you? A more realistic one? 
I don't read comic books for realism. Or at least I don't read superhero comics for realism. If my suspension of disbelief has already reached people flying with magic strength and inheriting the wisdom of mythical Greek figures, I want somebody who's supposed to be a symbol of innocence and purity to be a symbol of innocence and purity, goddammit. <laughs> Well, you just don't get the onion voice. The mythical one you do. The made-up one. This is written by a guy named Jeff Johns. Uh -huh. The reason I still have not watched Zachary Levi's uh, Shazam film is because it was apparently based Yay. off this version of Captain Marvel. Yeah, I can already see from the trailers it is. And that makes me feel the same way I feel... When I have mistakenly had too much oil in my diet and, you know, that bowel pressure comes along mm -hmm. that will not wait. Mm -hmm. That is what Jeff John's Shazam makes me feel. Like, I should respond the way a bird would. By climbing up somewhere high and taking a leaky liquid shit on his head. I need a whole episode of you just reading the comic. No. <laughs> I don't think my doctor will allow me to. Blood pressure and all that. I'm sure we could talk her into it. Oh, wait. Probably. All right. Well, a little bit of a rant and a lot of history. What do you think? I enjoyed <laughs> And with that, class is no longer in session.